Uh, oh, there are more people coming. Good. I think we can start. We only have an hour. Yeah. And good morning, everyone. Uh, so we're going to start on time because we only have an hour and we'd like to do as much as possible within this hour and thank you to all of you who came. We realize we are, this session is in the middle of two other sessions that are focusing on children and digital connectivity. But today uh, we are going to talk about uh, children's rights and emerging technologies in particular artificial intelligence. My name is Yasmina Byrne and I'm uh, from UNICEF. Uh, I'm a chief of UNICEF's policy lab. And uh, today's panelists are Jenny Bernstein, who is over there. Jenny is also uh, with UNICEF. She's working with UNICEF Office of Innovation, and she's an urban innovation specialist. Uh, and she's also leading uh, our work with um, World Economic Forum in Berkeley on children and artificial intelligence. Then I'll introduce Sandra Cortesi, who you, many of you already know. She's a director of the Youth and Media Project at the Berkman Klein uh, Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. <laughs> uh, Steve Oslo is my colleague who uh, used to work in uh, UNESCO but he is now a digital policy specialist in uh, UNICEF headquarters. Uh, and uh, Feng Chun Miao, uh, who is joining us from uh, UNESCO, he is uh, chief of unit of uh, ICT in education that is focusing on ICT education policy and teacher professional development and I understand also emerging technologies. And uh, finally we have uh, Johnny Penn, he's affiliate of the Berkman Center but also uh, currently um, with the University of Cambridge, he's uh, had fellowship at Google, Meet Media Lab and Leverholm Center for the Future of Intelligence. So um, we'll start with Jenny, who will tell us a little bit more about this initiative that UNICEF uh, has started. So ju just to clarify, we really want this to be an interactive session. We hope to get a lot of input from you, but we'll also give you our contact details so that we can continue having a conversation with you. And uh, we hope that this could be really a joint effort. Jenny, over to you. Oh, right. Okay. Does this work? Fantastic. Um, so as Yasmina mentioned, I'm also with UNICEF, and I work on our innovation team. Um, we just started some work trying to explore this intersection of children's rights and AI, and I think it's important to just frame this discussion first by stating that UNICEF as an organization, our main uh, mandate and what we are all trying to do on a daily basis is to protect the rights of every child. And when we talk about children's rights, we talk about it from uh, the framework that is given to us from the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So this is a very comprehensive document that's holistic in nature. So it's not just talking about, um, let's say, uh, physical or social rights of the child. There's also a deference to political rights and to emotional rights. Um, and that's something that we think is really valuable when talking about emerging spaces and challenges. So it's really valuable for us to, to look back to this framework. It's also a public sector mandate. So states that are a subscri subscribers and upholders of this uh, convention are mandated to uphold it. And there are mechanisms in place to make that actionable and that's another really valuable thing. Um, there's private sector relevance, and we'll talk a lot about that today. And this is a nearly universal um, convention. And within it, there are a few things just to keep in the back of our minds um, that are kind of underpinning the entire very long um, convention. Uh, respect for the views of the child. So really making sure that um, children's views are uh, respected and maintained and also heard. Um, Non-discrimination, the right to survival and development, those are pretty self-explanatory but very critical to everything we'll discuss. And then dignity and the best interests of the child, uh, which is a bit harder to sometimes define but always central to the discussion. Um, so in the children and AI work, which as you mentioned is a new initiative sort of 
very much in the exploratory phases of trying to map out some sort of design um, research that can help us understand the most pressing areas of uh, opportunity and, of course, risk. So this is about just getting the right people to the table, understanding that's not only technologists or only child rights advocates, um, but really everyone who has an experience with or has a concern around advancing children's rights in the context of generation AI and the AI age. Um, we are designing early stage research to map out existing literature that's out there that signals um, where people have stepped in to either advance child rights or protect against abuses when it relates to a specific AI application, and I'll talk briefly about some of those. Um, but what we're trying to get to with this work, which we expect will be many years of collaboration, is actionable recommendations for governments, companies, caregivers, and so on, for how we can take our newfound understanding of uh, the rights and risks at play and, uh, and move children's rights to the center of the, not just the conversation, but of the action being taken. Um, and so we've built a framework with some very high level areas of both opportunities and risks. Um, pretty self-explanatory, so I won't go into too much detail, but of course uh, we see tremendous opportunity around what adaptable AI can mean, especially when you think of things like tailoring uh, learning systems to a specific child's needs and context. Um, what can big data tell us about how to target resources and design interventions. Uh, UNICEF is trying to map every school in the world using satellite imagery and AI, and that will allow us to much better understand where there are gaps in services and where we can target our work. Cognitive support can span a whole spectrum of interventions, um, but we know that AI can help us enhance our existing intellectual abilities and um, fill in gaps where needed. And this is really closely related to enabling accessibility. Um, we think that disabled children or children that are differently able to have stand to gain almost the most through AI, and that's the opportunities there are almost endless. Um, and necessarily tied to all these opportunities are, of course, risks that we are very committed to understanding. Um, privacy, safety, and security are probably at the center of most conversations when it comes to human rights and child rights uh, as they intersect with the digital age and AI in particular. But there's also less visible concerns around access to services. When we uh, enable machines to dictate who, for instance, gets accepted to a school, uh, who gets a job or is lent credit or insurance, um, we see reinforced existing biases, we see new patterns of inequality emerging, and a whole suite of risks that we don't yet understand. Uh, when it comes to livelihood and dignity, we know that there will be a huge disruption in terms of what uh, employment means, what work means in the age of automation, and we're very concerned about understanding uh, what that means for children's dignity and preparing them for this next phase of life. And we think there are also emotional, psychological implications for what it means when a child is interacting with uh, a smart device as their best friend, for instance. Um, and that's a really nascent space of research. Um, so a couple quick case studies. Apologies for the formatting here. Um, we have heard from the Berkeley students that we're working with um, who conducted some exploratory research I mentioned, a couple of interesting sort of snapshots of where AI is interfacing with children in a, a pretty visible and direct nature. Um, educational robots, that market is growing tremendously quickly in places like the US. Um, and just sort of a side note here, we recognize that these case studies are very Global North focused because that's where a lot of the advances in technology are being seen to date. But something we want out of this conversation is uh, to look at other examples and case studies. So just to keep that in mind. Um, but as deep learning enables more sophisticated uh, robots to be put into traditional education settings and to be teaching children in non-traditional settings as well, uh, we're interested in trying to understand what the interaction between a child and 
a robot really means in terms of their learning process and their fundamental rights to education. Um, so there's a lot of literature out there around the benefits, about enhancing academic skills, about uh, giving new opportunities to children that are differently abled. There's less literature available around the, the downside of these things, um, and that's kind of self-evident because a lot of the research is, is funded by companies that want to see the good side. So we're curious to understand the right to protection, uh, the right to freedom from exploitation, and what that means when, um, when children are interacting with robots in learning environments. A similar example is seen in smart toys, which are devices that are specifically targeted at children and that uh, unbeknownst often to children are collecting data and surveilling children's behavior. Um, and this presents new challenges around data and privacy and just questions around what it means for, for children to be engaging with these um, artificial intelligence uh, products at different points in their, their life. Um, so the right, rights here aren't just about privacy and data misuse, um, but more broadly around the duty to protect and whose duty is it to, to step in and make sure that smart toys are designed with and for children uh, representing their rights. So <clears throat> just to briefly state that, as I mentioned, but this is like a very long-term research initiative that um, that UNICEF is, is leading with our partners and part of uh, our mission here today is to uh, figure out who else needs to be at the table for this conversation to be really fruitful and yield those um, actionable recommendations and partnerships that we hope to, to see come out of this. Um, and some questions that we'll revisit at the end of uh, this session or throughout it are just whether or not these are the right areas to be looking into in terms of opportunity and risk. Of course, there's so much that we could address. This is an extremely ambitious uh, research agenda, so we'd love to hear if there are more specific case studies from, from you all that we can share and integrate and, and who else we should be working with. So I'm um, going to pass it off to Sandra now to talk a bit more about Berkman's work. Yes. Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me as part of this session. Again, my name is Sandra Cortesi. I'm here with my colleagues Andres Lombana, who helps me lead Youth and Media, and Christian Fisolo, with whom I collaborate uh, on this project. Uh, my background is actually in psychology, so I'm not a rights expert, as, as the title of the session suggests. But uh, luckily, I have many colleagues at Berkman Klein who are uh, rights experts, and I just wanted to make a quick pitch for a report that came out very recently looking not just uh, at young people, and when I say young people, by the way, I mean young people ages 12 to 18, so in the U.S. minors, uh, but I wanted to make a pitch for this report and share very briefly just a few observations or the, basically the highlights that came out of it. The first one is that determining the impacts of AI on human rights is really not easy as these technologies are being introduced into institutions and spaces, in the case of young people, uh, in, uh, spaces such as schools or the inter entertainment industry or healthcare systems that are not rights neutral. Uh, second point, determining uh, the human rights impacts of AI is that in in many cases, these rights, uh, kind of the impacts of those rights are complicated because they are occasionally, they contradict each other. So if you think about the rights for more privacy versus the rights for more safety, it doesn't mean that they go hand in hand. And when you measure the impacts, again, of uh, human rights on AI, uh, uh, the other way around, um, you can say that AI impacts the full range of human rights, as Jenny just mentioned and showed a few to you, but privacy is the one that currently is being most impacted according to their analysis, um, and that the impacts are not distributed equally. So uh, certain communities or certain populations uh, are more affected than others, uh, either in a positive or negative way, which I think it's important to remember because in the case of young people, if you read most of the big reports that uh, have come out, 
young people are rarely mentioned in it, and so I feel like the verdict is still out to a certain extent. So what we do at Berkman Klein, and uh, if you don't mind skipping to the next slide, is we have defined for us the four areas that we think are relevant, again, when we talk about youth ages 12 to 18, which are these four, and I won't go into each of them because I only have very few minutes, uh, but the four are identity, privacy, learning, and well-being. And across these four areas, you can imagine a, a range of um, rights in the sense of the CRC and how they apply. So for instance, when we talk about identity, you could think about uh, the right of leisure, play, and culture to be abstract. But you, we are, for instance, we're looking into uh, art created by AI and what does it mean for a young person uh, how do, will it potentially impact his or her, or their motivations uh, to create their own artistic work uh, in that context? Or for instance, we look at privacy and we are currently figuring out what does it mean um, when young people are in the space where much of the adult world around them is trying to protect them and how does their, the right of for protection, uh, how does it play with the right of privacy from the perspective of youth? Um, who decides, basically, and at what cost will it come and who is carrying the costs? Uh, in the learning space, we're looking at uh, education and we feel like there is a need to develop curricular material around the ethical considerations and implications of AI systems, but we're not sure who is developing this. Uh, and basically uh, what narrative is going to be used uh, when developing these materials. And for well-being, just many, many questions, but one of them is, for instance, how will these toys, that Jenny just mentioned a few, but how will this voice-operated assistance, for instance, shape young people's behavior in a positive or negative way, or how can they be used to shape uh, behavior? Uh, if you look at the next slide, this is just one way of how we're trying to have a slightly more holistic conversation. In most cases, young people are considered just the users of, of these technologies. So in most cases, we talk about uh, the deployment of these tools and the impact it will have on young people. So I think by splitting it up and looking at the design process, the development process, the deployment process, and the evaluation stage, if you split it up, it, it allows you to have a slightly more nuanced analysis of the issues. And then on the left side in green, you see some of the areas. Just to give you one question for each that I feel to me is interesting on the design side. And again, that's also a lot of my colleague Andres's work. Um, we feel like we have to make sure that youth have the opportunities and interfaces to participate and co-design the technologies and policies that will shape their futures, but how are we gonna do that is a, is a big challenge. Uh, on the development side, uh, one question is, how can we make sure that AI-based technologies do not identify and reinforce the biases of their designers or available training data? Uh, here again, particularly biases that we have against young people themselves. Uh, and training data that is often not uh, including youth um, data. And the last question I have on the deployment side, how can we ensure that youth can understand how decisions are made about them in order to maintain their confidence <laughs> in the system and the institutions? So I think these are just some of the high level questions that I'm curious to hear your response. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. So uh, now uh, we've, we've seen these two presentations. We'll hear uh, some quick reactions and responses from uh, Steve, Johnny, and uh, Peng Chun. Uh, Steve, uh, will you go first and tell us a few words about your work and your thinking about this? Thanks, Yasmina. Um, so I'm on Yasmina's team, um, new to UNICEF, come from UNESCO, so it's good to be here. And um, I wanted to just say that we in the policy lab are going to be focusing particularly on digital skills and literacies and um, for, for children, but particularly interesting in this context, thinking about what does that mean in an AI world? Um, and so Jenny gave some good examples of probably quite advanced and as she said, kind of northern, global north developed examples of, of AI toys and, and AI robots. 
but already AI is being used by us and by children. For example, um, if you open Google Maps, your route suggestions for walking, that's AI-based. Autocorrect on your phone is AI-based. Um, Netflix Kids recommendations of what to watch next is AI-based. Um, so some of these are quite benign and they obviously are useful and, and improve our user experience. And then there's the other end of the scale, which is more, uh, I come from an education tech background, used to work with Feng Shun. So within education, for example, as more data is collected about children, uh, there's an incredible opportunity to really streamline and personalize education based on this each individual child. At the same time, uh, you can begin to stream and profile a child in a way that defines them for the rest of their life um, and says, well, this child isn't so good at maths in grade seven uh, and so they shouldn't follow this career. And even though it's potentially a, a good example, uh, it, c it can kind of define you in a way that perhaps, you know, posting something uh, that you shouldn't have done on Facebook can define you for the rest of your life and the age of kind of your, your memories never being forgotten. Um, and so how do we develop the digital skills and literacies of children in a way that makes them survive and thrive and, and fulfill those rights um, in an in a AI world? And so some of, the, um, some of the skills we look at, obviously the, the traditional kind of digital literacies um, and just using the tools, that, the technical skills, but also the data literacies and how do we, how do we get children not just to be users but also to be kind of conscious, what we would call in a consumer rights perspective, kind of conscious uh, consumers. To say, well, you have rights. Um, your data is being collected, your data is being used. You have a right to question that. And how is that data being used? And can you get that data back? Can you delete it? Can you, um, can you own it? Uh, the cognitive skills around criticality, uh, critical thinking skills. And then I think very important in this case, the reflective skills and thinking more broadly and getting, and this applies so much to adults as well as to children, thinking broadly around these issues of AI and ethics of fairness, of inclusion. Um, these are not things that you think of when you're using autocorrect or when you're posting on Snapchat, um, but increasingly they are important. And as our lives become more digital, those are the questions we need to have at the back of our minds all the time. And so this is the work that we'll be doing. We are working closely with, um, with Jenny and the innovation team at, at UNICEF. And I think maybe if I can just end with two, two quick questions. Um, we in the policy lab, and we, we're going to be looking at or asking what policies enable the inclusion of children in the AI design process, uh, not just users, but, but also as co-creators. And then thinking very much around the private sector. Um, private sector are our partners, and they, are, they have much power in actually developing these incredible systems that hold so much potential. Um, but how do we kind of raise the flag and how, for children and children's rights and how do we work with the private sector and governments um, to ensure that children's rights and children's, the CRC is held at the, at the heart of the products and the services being developed. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Steve. So uh, over to you, uh, Feng Chun, for a few words about what UNESCO is doing in this space. Yeah. Uh, my name is Feng Chunmiao. I'm the chief of uh, unit for ICT education. Uh, UNESCO has been putting um, the top priority to uh, artificial intelligence in uh, core areas of UNESCO. And uh, we are developing uh, an instrument uh, uh, on the uh, recommendation on the AI. Basically, it's about the ethics relating to AI. Uh, that should be adopted um, by, I, to my memory, is 2022. We are still developing it. And from education sector, we actually, just to rally on the ideas presented earlier, uh, we're developing a policy guideline on AI education. And uh, hopefully we can complete it and uh, we are uh, launched it during the Mobile Learning Week 2019. We have been organizing Mobile Learning Week for seven years. The eight years will be the next one. It's a special edition about the, uh, we call it artificial 
intelligent uh, augmented mobile learning, or in brief, we call it uh, a special edition on uh, intelligent mobile learning uh, that will take place from 4th to 8th March. And uh, I would like to invite all the panelists to join us uh, in the mobile learning week. And uh, at the same time, we were also uh, working with uh, other private sector, for example, Microsoft, Ericsson, in uh, promote the readiness of the education sector to adopt uh, uh, AI in education and learning, including uh, developing the, in, uh, the capacity of the policy makers. And also we are developing, we call it uh, uh, indexed uh, of the readiness of education sector in adopting artificial intelligence. So it's more like uh, AI readiness indexed for the education sector. Uh, at the same time, we are also developing some curriculum that could guide especially the public institutions in terms of what kind of uh, curriculum, values, skills they should develop uh, for the next generation. So in this context, I also want to ask another fundamental question. Basically, we are talking about how we should prepare the next generation to become active and responsible users and the creators of artificial intelligence. So for this purpose, I think we should answer a very fundamental question. I, to me, it's only one question. So uh, what is the human machine collective intelligence we should develop, uh, both for the individual benefits and also for the public good? Uh, to, my, to my points, we should think of four layers. First of all, what are the unique intelligence, the human intelligence, we should reinforce even in front of stronger and stronger artificial intelligence. So it, it both in terms of, the, for example, we have been outsourcing our working memory to the computer memory. We have been outsourcing our information processing uh, to the uh, uh, Google and other searching engines. So we are continue to outsource our decision-making ability to the machine learning, to the deep learning. So what's the boundary? I know the boundary should be dynamic, it keep changing, but we need to set up a kind of a principle about what are the unique human intelligence we should continue to develop among our next generation, especially the children. So this is uh, the first layer. The second layer is really the metacognition. Uh, we, you know, it's the psychology, and you know, we should develop, uh, including the awareness uh, on, on data privacy. To me, the data privacy for an individual uh, child is about their metacognition. So what kind of metacognitive uh, ability we should develop among the next generation, uh, both in terms of the data privacy, but also more about the when to use a machine, when to stop using machine and to use our own uh, intelligence. And the third layer is uh, what I mentioned, the human machine uh, collective intelligence, including the advanced uh, AI skills that could help the next generation to find a job in the AI era, because we know that the AI is creating new jobs when it's, uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, creating the job, job loss. So uh, what kind of advanced uh, skills we should develop for the next generation in order to help them to find a job in uh, AI, we call it economy as well. And the first que uh, question, sub-question relating to this is uh, uh, the social values uh, we should develop. Uh, that is related to the development, um, including what you said, you know, design, development, deployment, and evaluation of AI. So that's, uh, first of all, I think I still need to ask the question that, uh, you know, we should think of the human machine collective intelligence before uh, we develop and use AI in education and for learning. That's all. Thank you so much. These are really interesting observations. And just to mention uh, also uh, things and questions that concern us in UNICEF as well. We, uh, UNICEF is also working uh, in a number of our uh, sections on, um, on employability and skills that are needed for the 21st century. And clearly, the skills related to use of technologies and AI are related. So finally, over to you, John, to say a few concluding words. And then we have about 25 minutes for discussion. Thank you. I'll keep my comments short. Um, so I had I had dinner with the CEO of a big um, Chinese ed tech uh, company about two weeks ago, and he was describing their process for how they want to treat, uh, you know, prepare the next generation for a changing workforce. And he just said, you know, when we look at learning now, we think of, you know, some people are physical learners, or some people are visual learners, or auditory learners. And he says you can think about these things as pixels. 
And the cameras we have now are, now are really, you know, the education system we have now is very low resolution, right, because we only are working with a couple pixels. And what AI will allow is to start to see the sequences and, the, and, and bring more pixels, more resolution to this picture of what, of, of, of how a child learns. So you might find that uh, someone is a physical learner when it comes to physics uh, or a visual learner when it comes to arithmetic or that each of us is very different. And he said they, they have 30,000 indicators in their system in China for different ways that people can learn. And you might hear this and, and look to the future of AI and think, well, this is fantastic, but I would argue that it's, it's not. Uh, because although this uh, will enable us to do new things, it's also a trap. Um, and part of that is because it will predict for children who, as you've heard today from, um, from, from, um, from our speakers already, it will predict for children uh, who they have to be in the world that maybe they can't go on to do the sort of profession they want because uh, 30,000 indicators suggest that they're not going to learn it sufficiently well for them to be useful in the global economy doing that job. Um, and weirdly, that's not so different from the system we have already. You know, if you don't score highly enough in, in, in high school, maybe you can't go uh, to the college that you want to go to, even though if you were to go to that college, you may have a very successful career. And my worry is that AI will make this much worse. And so my comments uh, are, are as simple as this. Uh, I think, first of all, we need to break the myth of um, uh, of seeing children as somehow kind of incapable of contributing to these important decisions. Um, uh, there's strong evidence to suggest that children are actually much, that is much smarter than artificial intelligence. So um, the devel developmental psychologist named Alison Gopnik, who's uh, looked at the way children learn and showed that, that children and teenagers especially are wired uh, to, to, to not discount unlikely hypotheses. And they, they think like scientists. They say, well, what if? Whereas machine learning and, and AI thinks like adults. It looks for existing patterns and then trains to see, does this conform to what I already know? And as you know, young people are willing to take more exp uh, an experimental view of, of what is right or wrong or what, how things ought to be. And I see this in uh, young people's treatment of gender and sexuality these days. They refuse the binaries that past generations have given them, saying that you either are a man or a woman or you have this sort of relationship. And I think we're all better off for it. And so when we think of how young people can participate in the future of what is effectively a category setting tool, we have to remember that they have a better, they are better equipped than we as, as adults are to understand the sort of uh, categories we might want to embrace. Um, and as such, I think we should recognize child as base, uh, childhood, the period of, of our lives we call childhood, as an act of resistance and not a process of conforming young people to what we want of them. We could think of it uh, as, as childhood as a laboratory and not a factory. So you're not just kind of harvest, harvested for what you know, but you're honored for your contribution. Um, so to close out, I, I guess looking to the future in, in terms of AI and children, um, you know, the power rests in two areas, in my view, uh, in, in the future with artificial intelligence. The first area is choosing uh, metrics, which ep metrics we optimize for. And as you've heard from our, our experts already today, young people need to be a part of that process. They need to be a part of the co-design process. I looked on Google Maps a minute ago. There's a high school 300 meters from here, and yet there's not one young person in this room. What right do we have to choose uh, these young people's future for them in a system where elsewhere we have things like no taxation without representation? If they are not represented here, um, we shouldn't speak for them. And, and in fact, it would be as simple as instituting a, a system of sortation where young people are brought in uh, and uh, almost randomly, like jury duty for, ki for kids to be a part of this um, co-design process. Um, and similarly, you know, lawmakers have suggested doing T's and C's, uh, you know, visually, so young people uh, and teenagers can understand them. I, I would encourage that we pursue that as well if we're talking about what rights young people and children should be entitled to. To close out, the second area of power in an era, uh, an era of AI, I would argue, is choosing what is not measured. We make a decision not to optimize some aspects of our life, and I think childhood should be one of them. So I would argue for the following three rights to close. The first is a right to be forgotten for youth. I think that we should think about the data that's collected about young people as sensitive, and that they should have greater uh, design affordances uh, 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 given to them to, for example, delete their, uh, their Facebook or Snapchat or Kik uh, uh, activity from the age of 18 and prior, should they choose to, when they become an adult, or even during their childhood.
that should be easier and it should, it should be made easier by, when backed by a right. The second is a right to fluidity uh, and this is partly to move us away from this, 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 this belief that big data somehow equals truth. It doesn't. Uh, big data informs our understanding of the world but is not necessarily what is true of the world and uh, young people should be allowed to have fluidity in, in terms of what categories are put upon them. Uh, the trouble with the, the, the metaphor that that CEO gave me about pixels is that uh, pixels describe the, the natural world. They'll show if a color relates to what you see, whereas categories of how people learn are not necessarily rooted in natural science. They're, they're just opinions. Um, I won't get into that. But the final is uh, a right to flourish, which is perhaps maybe not the right way to convey this point, but the idea here is that uh, we must recognize that training young people for the world today is not necessarily an adequate, um, uh, uh, I think, uh, use of their talent. We have to imagine that the future can be better than it is today um, and not just train them to be kind of economic cogs on a wheel. We've already seen with the rise in teen suicide rates that this isn't working. Um, so we have to imagine a much bolder vision of the future. I think that's our responsibility to children. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny, uh, on uh, this really uh, excellent uh, philosophical contribution to, to our discussion. Uh, I, I think we can argue also whether we should have children in this room or not, because uh, I hear several times people have mentioned really importance of child participation, but how do we make sure that the participation is meaningful and representative of all children and all different groups and minority groups, including? So uh, now we have about 25 minutes for your observations, comments, and discussion. As you heard, we have more questions than answers. And just to, uh, we put back the slide where we are uh, asking these questions. And please, even when the session is over, reach out to us, contact us. You have Steve's and Jenny's emails, but you can also speak to Sandra and Feng Chun. And I hope that we form a little group of those people who are interested in uh, working and exploring this topic more. So over to you. Anybody wants to make any comments or contributions? Uh, just please introduce yourselves because we didn't have time to do a round. Yes. Patrick Iserius at Telia Company, Telco Nordic and Baltics, uh, and also a member of the GNI uh, board. Uh, just to pick up on, on children participation, uh, Telia Company has done that. We have children advisory panels. Uh, and had throughout the company and, and for those interested there are some results of those advisory panels uh, available on our homepage. Uh, and we've actually also invited uh, this only once so far uh, a child panel to to meet with our <laughs> board uh, so we are trying but as you said it's difficult to find <laughs> so that it is representative and meaningful, etc. But uh, at least when it comes to the panels, there are some uh, outputs that we have published. Thanks. Wonderful. Uh, any, do we have any remote participants with comments or questions? No, nothing. Uh, anybody else from the room? Yes. Um, hello, my name is Milka Pietikainen. Um, I've worked in the tech sector for really 20 years and, and just for full disclosure I'm working with UNICEF at the moment um, as, as a consultant um, on children and online gaming um, at the moment looking at, at issues that, that that sector poses for, for child rights and in, in my previous work as a, with a telecom um, operator I worked with UNICEF uh, child rights and business unit uh, specifically taking at children's rights and, and, and business principles and applying those to the operations of, of telecom operators and, and trying to define what were the most salient child rights issues um, and we also worked on um, a child rights impact assessment tool um, for, for the sector. And, and to your question about you know, how, how to engage um, the, the private sector, um, I, I think um, my, my company where I worked before, Millicom, was one of the kind of champions um, that UNICEF found from that particular sector. They were also working with Lego um, on, on, on other issues, more, more on, on the digital um, um, chat rooms and, and, and games, um, games online as well. And I think this is one, one way to go. Um, as you mentioned, artificial intelligence is coming to all sectors um, and, and identifying some champion companies with whom to kind of dig deeper um, who are willing to open up um, their operations um, and, and really look at uh, the business models and, and, and how, how the company works and what kind of stakeholders they interact with, um, how they interact with communities, um, etc. I, th I think that that's um, definitely one, one solution at least uh, w worked in, in my past. 
Thank you so much. Yeah, it's definitely working with businesses. Any suggestions and comments? I know UNICEF has always had a really good collaboration with telecommunication uh, companies, uh, but really uh, bringing other businesses around the table and talking about what it means in terms of artificial intelligence. And also uh, going back to, yes, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll add my comments at the end. Hi, thank you for all the talks. It was really interesting. I'm Vanessa Newark. I'm a philosopher. I'm an ethicist. And I, I just wanted to focus on an issue which seems really important to me, and I think we didn't really tackle it. What is so specific about this generation of native users of artificial intelligence? And I have uh, the feeling that this could be very important in our discussion, so I would really love to hear you about this. Um, I would, I would, um, I, I don't know, I push back on the idea of digital natives. I think it's, um, it's too broad a uh, brush to paint on youth. You know, not all youth have the same access uh, to bandwidth and interfaces. Uh, and then uh, Sandra would be much better positioned probably to talk about that than I would. Um, but. As to the native users of AI, I mean, personally, I, I, I try and steer away from talking about youth and children in my own work because I prefer to talk about millennials and post-millennials and the particular challenges that they face. Um, and in a world in which, you know, 1% of the global population is on track to control two-thirds of the world's wealth in t 12 years from now, if we aren't talking about that for the next generation, I feel like we're neglecting their, you know, we have a responsibility to account for very particular set of challenges, so I, I think you're right. But I also think that's, that's well, I open to the room if that's a separate conversation or not. Okay. So we have one more question over there. Um, yeah, hi. Um, Gero Nagel um, here from the youth IGF in Germany and also working for an AI company currently. Um, I have two points. One is a question, a rather quick one, um, and I want to explain it a little bit. Um, the question is, um, why is it better if um, like humans or something decide what happens with the children than an AI? As it seemed like at several points that um, kind of when an AI predicts who you might going to be at some time, that's kind of evil. But like if humans, if your parents, if your teachers or something do that for you, that's okay. Um, and that's like, in my case, kind of the point too. Um, as for example, like um, I was like just res rather recently diagnosed with ADHD, which um, looking backwards, I would be very happy if there would have been like some AI that would have diagnosed me with it um, like 20 years ago or something and would have um, saved like lots of my struggles that no one noticed because I have ADHD, but I'm like not hyperactive and therefore no one noticed it, um, which makes stuff sometimes hard. Um, and the other point is um, about like the youth participation. Um, I mean, I'm like kind of here for the youth and I'm 28. That feels already like pretty odd to represent, uh, represent the youth like being older than half of the world population. Um, what, and like I'm also like kind of pushing back on like the digital native idea, but what I do see and like what I'm um, learned is that generally technology, like new technology, is like always adopted first by like young people because they grew up with it. And like the older you get, like the, the more you know already the world and the changes in the world are like rather hard to, or like harder to adapt because you adapted already to some kind of work. And therefore I think it is pretty important to um, get young people involved always, even if it is like quite exhausting as you have to explain lots of things that they don't know yet. And yet they do have like a different approach generally and therefore it's like very, like, from my point of view, very important to always have them at the table because they have a different view to the world. They grow up with it differently. Uh, thank you, very challenging question. So let's see who uh, wants to try to answer, Steve and uh, Sandra. Very good points. Just quickly on the, um, on the first question, you know, why shouldn't AI decide? Um, I th it's a very, it's a good question. I think the, the issue, well, the, the, the issue that's often raised is that <clears throat> we, we have a problem when the AI decision is in a black box that nobody understands, right? And so with the humans, you could potentially question that and say, well, you know, you could have a, com in theory, because I know, I know what you're saying, a lot of, a lot of what we're saying today, we're trying to create a world that 
it doesn't exist, an AI world that's aspirational, and to undo many of the pro things that are biases and prejudices in the real world. But algorithms are, are, are being used to diagnose people uh, or to screen them um, in education or to make criminal justice decisions around them, whether to hire or fire, in ways that are not transparent, and that's, that's problematic, where you don't understand the, the algorithm and, and, and the data behind it. And so that's one of the big things, one of the big principles is this algorithmic accountability and transparency. And the, the New York City government, uh, I think is one of the first governments in the world that is now mandating that any city funds being spent on IT systems that have algorithms need to be open and, and open to scrutiny. Um, because often, you know, companies will say, well, that we can't show you because this is our, you know, intellectual property or our competitive advantage. So that was the one. And then on the youth, um, just one point of reflection, you know, I, if you look at some of the cycles happening between generations, um, I read a report recently that said um, the average American teenager um, is more uh, drinks less than their parents, smokes less, swears less, is much more, this is the average, okay? <clears throat> um, this is Pew, but it's just, it's an interesting example that is more conscious of the environment, recycles more. And so my kind of secret hope is that maybe uh, we were the first generation to really impact with these technologies, whereas the next generation, hopefully, is actually more, if we can get this right, and engage them and, and create the right boundaries, is more conscious and perhaps asks more questions than we, than we asked with the systems that we use uh, and the way that we've given our data away and, the, and, um, and our behavior. So maybe the next generation will actually be more uh, circumspect than, than this one, and that's, that's kind of the secret hope. Uh, thank you, thank you, Steve. And, and obviously, uh, any any uh, data processing and machine learning is only as good as the data you put into it. So, if the data uh, that was collected to begin with by a human <laughs> is biased, you're going to have a biased outcome, obviously. So, Sandra, you know, my, my response would have been probably almost the same, but I was going to say. On one hand, there are many areas where I do believe AI would make better decisions than a human. Could be healthcare, could be decision making about potential applicants or candidates. In that case, I do think it would be good for a young person to understand how the technology came to that decision. I think that will strengthen the trust that uh, youth have in these institutions and in these systems. On the other hand, with, this is a youth session and not an adult session, so I think most processes or more, most AI-based technologies are currently being developed with adult data and systems that use adult data to make decisions about youth are just, in my opinion, inherently complicated because they might not make decisions that are in youth favor. So I think at least you should have youth along that decision-making process. So in case the machine makes a decision that is not in youth favor, someone is able to detect that and mention it and point to it so we can change the system itself. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. Uh, yes. Thank you. My name is Marcelino Cabrera, and I work in the European Commission, the Joint Research Center. I'm also a psychologist and a computer scientist. And uh, we have been carrying out some uh, kind of uh, foresight uh, work uh, in my institution uh, on the impact of the artificial intelligence in education and, and training and learning. Eh? And we have come with a few messages that we'd like to share with you. The publication will be ready. I will send it to you and you. Uh, certainly in a few days, but I would like to say you uh, a few messages that uh, we have come up. Personalized learning environment, that's one key message, will definitely enter the classrooms. Uh, that, uh, thanks to artificial intelligence, uh, will be possible that you create personalized environments and even deal with uh, big, big problems uh, that we have had uh, with uh, children that have uh, uh, disorders and we do not know, we cannot tackle, we are not arriving on time. 
artificial intelligence can help also to detect dyscalculia in time, eh? uh, dyslexia, uh, disorders, uh, attentional disorders and the like. And uh, then the classrooms will look like more mastered thanks to the te technology and the teacher playing a fundamental role. On the other hand, we have seen also obscure sites eh, that we have to be aware and conscious. Uh, the artificial intelligence, you, you remember the well-known principles, uh, Pygmalion and, uh, and Golan effects, could increase that as well. So that could put children into clusters eh, and by that predetermine their lives in a way. This is something which is a concern, a popular concern. Eh? that uh, AI will classify people and people will do that, what they're expected to do in the future. Kind of science fiction, okay, it could be, but I think there is some part of true in this and we, it's about uh, saying to the policy makers that it can happen, don't solutions can be, should be provided uh, to prevent that. Uh, in artificial intelligence, we are, I think, in my perception, we are uh, very often thinking of adults, adult contexts. Now, if we think of kids, that's changed the stake, it changed the game uh, completely different. Actually, one of the motto that circulates here and there, and I support this in education, no artificial intelligence, no AI without UI, no AI without user interface, which is something that can complement and uh, uh, in a bit now, in a way, downtown a bit the expectations by putting some uh, reality because we are not dealing with adults, we are uh, de uh, dealing with, in principle, vulnerable vulnerable groups like children. This is more or less. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, this uh, do we do we have anybody else here? I just wanted to go back, uh, if possible, to you, Feng Chun. So we keep mentioning education and use of AI in education and data, uh, and at, uh, as as uh, we heard, there are challenges with with data in terms of the quality of data, the, the problems of clustering children in a group. Uh, on the other hand, the benefits of personalized learning. How do you see uh, we can overcome some of these challenges in education in particular? Uh, I think so far the discussion uh, on the use of AI in education has been focused on the use of AI to personalize the learning process, to me meaning that we are using AI to do the learning analytics and uh, try to find a learning pattern and based on the learning pattern to provide um, some advice or even push, we call it a smart content or smart uh, you know, learning pathway to the learners. I think to me it's only one perspective of the use of AI education. And even for this one, I, I, I think we need to recall all the discussion, you know, who are designing the data structure, which means what kind of text we are putting on the data. So it's human. And who are developing the algorithm is still based on the human algorithm until uh, that maybe some of the learning system uh, adopt, uh, you know, the, like the Google Zero, which means the machine can learn from a machine. But so far, the use of the AI algorithm in the learning system uh, have not reached this level yet. We basically still the designer who are developing the data structure, the types of structure, the, the data and uh, the algorithm, which means it's human, uh, the, the machine decision with the human intervention. And, uh, and I want to, just for your information, there's some government that are deploying large scale learning system, for example, in China, in Beijing, the capital of, uh, of China. They are deploying a large scale learning system. And we, I want to wait and see uh, what's the result of the pilot test of using uh, this, material, this learning system for million students. And after a couple and three years, and uh, how the machine are helping the teacher. For example, they have the dual teacher model, which means that the machine teacher and the human teacher who are coaching the student uh, at the same time. And they are gathering the learning data every day from every student uh, from the a grade one of the junior secondary schools. So I want to see after three years, four years of data collection, what will come out. That's one perspective. For the others, I just want to mention the area of the use of, uh, use of AI in education. For example, how we could use AI to reduce or break through the barriers of the access to education. For example, the barrier includes the language. 
uh, next year is the, the, the year of, we call it the week of indigenous language in UNESCO. We have 5,000 languages uh, globally. 5,000, mo many, many of languages even only have a spoken word, they don't have the written word. How AI can help us? You know, these kind of people, they cannot access, you know, more than 90% of online content is not accessible to them because they cannot understand English. Uh, can really, really AI help us to reduce this kind of barrier, including the people, the person with the disability? How and to what extent AI can help them to break through the barriers, even to the, uh, to the access to basic education? I think this uh, topic we need to think very uh, critically. And uh, for the other purpose, for example, can AI really help in the remote test? Now we have the face recognition. For example, in TOEFL, GRE, FUS, can we conduct, uh, use the face recognition based on the mobile phone? And how can we use this technology to really promote uh, the test, remote test, and even the remote uh, certification uh, in the, for, the, for education? I think uh, we have a lot of, uh, more importantly, I think the most potential area is the use of uh, AI for the EMIS, Educational Management Information System, which means how to enable, we call it the data-based uh, uh, you know, policy making and the education management. So I think we need to think uh, wider, uh, you know, based on the use of AI to personalize the learning process. So that's uh, my input, but uh, I think, I believe you have more idea than me. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, a lot of food for thought. Uh, I kind of feel like the generation now or, or the young people today are um, the ones that we experiment with most, I don't know how they're going to turn out in the end. In, uh, we'll have to wait a few years to see what happens with this uh, in China. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, my name is Andres Lombana. I work at the Berman Klein Center for Internet and Society. Uh, thank you for the presentations. I have a question related to the home environment and the family dynamics. Uh, I know this is a, a, pan a panel or a round table on, on, on children rights, but I wonder like, what would be the role of parents and how uh, the family dynamics would change as we push for this kind of co-design of AI uh, and uh, pushing for more control of data from, from the youth. What kind of uh, preparation and, and learning would the parents also have for enabling this at home? Wow. <laughs> Training. <laughs> uh, anybody uh, volunteers to answer this question? What can parents do and what kind of learning or, or uh, parents need to have in order to uh, support their children to be engaged in this and to even understand the AI nowadays? Uh, Jenny, do you want to uh, also and say a few concluding words? Uh, sure. Um, thank you so much for your question. I think I, this might not be the most satisfying response, but just to note that I think a lot of the principles and guidelines and recommendations that are emerging in the space of AI and how to manage it against or including ethical principles or human rights <clears throat> guidelines focus a lot either on governments or on companies and how those actors should be responding. And something that we're really clear on from the very outset of this Children and AI large initiative is that caregivers, not just parents, but other people who are raising children, need to be a, a target audience for us. And we're trying to identify what the right format for presenting recommendations to a, a very diverse group of, of those types of caregivers should look like. So that's just, it's a research question we have um, that we don't yet have great answers to. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, Milk. Um, I, I think one, one idea which we were, when we we're looking at the children online gaming, I think the private sector has a responsibility to help parents in their task and has a, I think they also have um, an incentive to do so because when they do help parents to feel more in control um, of, of their children's use of technology and, and, and interaction, um, then there are less emotional responses and there's less regulation based on emotional responses. So, so I, I think in, in talking to, to the private sector um, about how, how they can help parents understand how their solutions work, um, you know, everything from what data they collect and um, et cetera, I think would be one solution. And we have somebody here at the back. 
Hello, my name is Anna Rewczyńska. I uh, work for Polish Safer Internet Center and uh, INSEF Network. And uh, I work for National Research Institute NASC. Uh, and recently we conducted research about uh, IoT and especially Internet of Choice. Is it an opportunity or a challenge? And we did it together with the third people, so the computer emergency response teams. We, we uh, did it from two focuses, one uh, social and another techn technological. And um, as a result, we published a guide for parents. The special focus was exactly on parents and uh, about privacy, from also from two points of view, the, the social and the technological. So if anybody, because now there is no time for that, but if anybody would like to talk about it, about talk about this research, we tested also a few toys, we checked what kind of data they gather, uh, is it safe how they, how they take the data, but also uh, how the family life can change. Do kids know that they are being recorded? I think it's extremely important issue, ethical issue, because kids, we checked kids, kids, have no idea they're being recorded. Parents even were surprised they can listen so easily from the applications, from the toys, to all conversations the kids are having with the toys. So I think it's extremely in interesting topic as well, how the family life can, can change. We need to wrap up. This is the end of our session. But uh, we've heard uh, some uh, really interesting, wonderful uh, insights. We asked who else we should be working with. Uh, I, I, it's great to have here UNESCO, European Commission, uh, academics, uh, psychologists, as well as private sector. I think we missed government people. Yesterday's panel on youth we had, we had uh, quite a few people from different government ministries from Afghanistan and, and Bhutan. Bhutan? No, not Bhutan, Bahrain. Uh, and, and now, uh, uh, it, it really, we would like to uh, see how to continue this conversation and bring uh, on board different stakeholders to see <coughs> what is needed, really, in terms of recommendations. Do we need regulation or do we need uh, self-regulation in the private sector? Do we need uh, some kind of more loose uh, recommendations that everybody can adhere to uh, when it comes to children's rights and business. So please, uh, children's rights and, and AI. So please uh, stay in touch with us and thank you uh, all for your participation and have a great day today.